Hi, and welcome to Studio 45's online service. My name is Sarah and I'm on staff here at NewSpring. The room may look empty now, but this is Studio 45 on the weekend. Studio 45 online service is more than a video, but a part of something amazing. You will learn about some awesome big ideas, which are something God wants to do inside you to change the world around you. Our biggest ideas are the big three, and we hope that while you join us online, that you know that you should treat others the way you want to be treated. Make the wise choice and trust God no matter what. So get your favorite snack, crank up that volume, and get ready because we start in three, two, one. The Bible is more than a single book. It's a collection of 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry written by dozens of different authors over thousands of years that all come together to tell one big story. It's a bigger story than you can even imagine. It's a big story about a really big God and what He did to rescue us. It shows us who we are and what we were created to do. Discover the story that shows you the character of God. Say Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! It is Christmas Eve, 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 Eve. I make sure I got that right. Uh, and it's only a few days away. Anybody have a countdown to Christmas thing going at their house where you just count down the days? Five days, four days, three days, two days, one day. Woohoo! Uh, well, we, we do that at my house. We love Christmas. If you've been here this month, you know we've been talking about the big. Uh, of Christmas, and you say, big idea, Christmas, I thought Christmas was a holiday. It is a holiday, but Christmas is so much more than that. See, a lot of times people celebrate Christmas, and they don't really know what they're celebrating, presents or lights, but those aren't what Christmas is really about. Christmas is about something so much bigger than that. So would you guys repeat this after me? Everybody say, Christmas! Christmas! Uh, repeat this after me nice and loud. Celebrating Jesus! Celebrating Jesus! God's greatest gift. See, that is, that is what Christmas is all about. It's the fact that Jesus came and he is the greatest gift for us. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to raise your hands for this question. Well, uh, let, me, let me do something where you can't raise your hands first. How many of you in the room love parties or celebrations? Make some noise. Just make some noise. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. You don't have to raise your hands for this one. You don't have to make noise for this one. But isn't it true as a fourth and fifth grader, like when you're a first and a second grader, everybody's kind of invited to everything. You're kind of best friends with everyone. But fourth, fifth grade, you start to realize like there's some parties you're not invited to, right? I mean, you don't have to raise your hands for that, but I remember I was about fourth or fifth grade when I realized there, were, there had been a birthday party uh, that was a kid in, in my school. He was in my classroom. He had a birthday party and I wasn't invited. And I remember that being really hard for me. But here's the thing. Today, we are talking about how, uh, who, let me, let me rephrase it. Today, we're talking about who was invited to the greatest birthday party of all time. And I think who it was, you'll find encouraging. But before we get into that story, I want to review a little bit, okay? Because I know we've got some people here. You haven't been here this month. You might not know what the big idea that we've been talking about. So let me kind of catch you up. The first week we were talking about Christmas, we were talking about celebrating Jesus, and this might sound kind of odd to you, but we went to the Old Testament. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with the Bible, uh, you, you, usually you see it look like this. It, a lot of people call it a book. Your Bible's not a book. It's 66 different books, and it all comes together to tell one story. So we went to the Old Testament, and we looked at a guy named Isaiah the very first week, and we heard how Isaiah, in the Old Testament, God gave him a vision of the future, and he wrote down things about Jesus, including saying this about the coming Messiah. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. He will rule over us, and he will be called Wonderful Advisor and Mighty God. That is what Isaiah said hundreds of years before Jesus came to the picture. In fact, if you have the Christmas extravaganza card, there's one of the verses you can memorize, Isaiah 9, 6. We have all these prophecies about Jesus, how Jesus was going to come. He was going to be the son of God. We have that in the Old Testament. And then the, uh, the next week, we talked about Mary and Joseph. Uh, specifically, we talked about how an angel visited Mary and said, hey, you're going to have a baby. God had never done anything like it before. He's never done anything like it since. An angel appeared to Mary, and as the angel appears to Mary, you can read this for yourself in the book of Luke, the angel tells Mary this. Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid, Mary. 
for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. So he says, hey, you're going to have a baby, and not only are you going to have a baby, you are going to have God's son. Like I said, God's never done anything like it before. He never do, has never done anything like it since. He tells Mary, you're going to have a baby. Now, here's the thing. When we're talking about the Christmas story, my guess is, as you picture Jesus being born on Christmas... My guess is you might picture something that kind of looks like this, or maybe it looks like this, or maybe it looks like what you have on your shelf at home, like the nativity setting, or maybe in your mind it looks like um, what you have seen in someone's yard before as a nativity decoration. It's like a silhouette, or it's a cartoon, or it's a caricature. There's nothing wrong with these pictures. These pictures help us when we're younger, but isn't it true as a fourth and fifth grader? You're getting to a point where you're older, and you're starting to not just believe what your parents tell you to believe, but you're starting to think about things critically for yourself. You're starting to believe things for yourself. And here's my point. When we read the story of Christmas, which is what we're going to do today, in the book of Luke, everybody say Luke. Yes. Chapter two, everybody say chapter two. Yes. What I hope we don't miss is that these were real life people that really lived. They were flesh and blood like us. We did this a few weeks ago uh, when I told the story. I, I, we used our Bible and we let the story come to life. And I'd like to do that today too. We're going to let the story of Christmas come to life and hopefully allow you to picture these as real life people, okay? So in the book of Luke, everybody say Luke, chapter two, everybody say chapter two. We are going to pick up by, let me give you a little uh, context, okay? First of all, you have Mary and Joseph, right? Mary is very pregnant and they live in a town called Nazareth, but Joseph has to travel because the Roman emperor says, hey, we're going to tax everybody, we're going to get their money, we want to get more power, so we're going to take a census. And they have everybody travel. So Mary, nine months pregnant with the Son of God, has to travel to Bethlehem on a dirt road, a real dirt road. 90 miles. Everybody say, whoa. whoa. That's a long ways. And then when they get to Bethlehem, maybe you've seen this in a movie or something like, uh, like a cartoon before. But when they get to Bethlehem, they go into the very real houses and shelter they needed. They can't find a place to stay. There's no room for them. Now, whether they were going to a hotel or they were staying with their family, there's some debate on that, but the bottom line is this. They didn't have room, and so they're going to go stay with the animals. And the time comes that Mary didn't just have to travel pregnant. She now has to give birth in a stable. Pretty amazing story. Now, that's where our story is going to pick up because I told you at the very beginning that we are going to look at who was invited to the greatest, Bible story, the greatest birthday party ever. In a small, sleepy, dusty hill outside of Bethlehem that the shepherds are at. Now, these shepherds, I really want you to you picture these shepherds, okay? Picture the shepherds, picture the hill, picture the, uh, the crickets are making noise, dusty field, stars in the sky, not like our sky where there's all the light pollution and you can't really see the stars. I mean, I'm talking about stars in the sky, you can see the stars. And these shepherds are used to living in this field with their sheep, watching their sheep, day in, day out. These shepherds were not impressive people. They didn't impress anybody. They weren't, they weren't somebody that people would look to and say, oh, I hope I can grow up and be a shepherd one day. These were just blue collar workers. And they're out in their fields and they're watching their sheep when suddenly an angel appears to these normal everyday shepherds and says this to these shepherds. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. It will bring joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And then suddenly that one angel is joined by a whole choir of angels. I don't know what a choir of angels sounds like, but they start oh! praising and worshiping God and telling them. And of course, the disciples, or the, the, these shepherds, when they hear this and they see the, the choir of angels, they quickly, they go to Bethlehem to find this baby that, that, that he said would be lying in a manger. So they go to Bethlehem, and as they go to Bethlehem, they go to see the same thing that I want you to picture. I want you to picture Mary. I want you to picture Joseph. And picture, as you picture this, picture a young couple that's probably nervous and scared beyond you can imagine. And with them is a little baby boy. And that newborn baby boy would one day be named Jesus. They would wait about eight days is what they would do to name him. That's, that was a Jewish custom. 
So after traveling and traveling and after laboring, Mary gives birth to a beautiful baby boy. Now as you picture that, I want you to imagine that you have Mary and you have Joseph. And shortly after, by the way, we, we read this in the book of Luke. Everybody say Luke. Chapter 2. We read that, the, that Mary and Joseph were joined by the shepherds. The shepherds come. And when the shepherds come, by the way, this is pretty amazing. They were told to go by angels. But they come. They travel. They go. They find exactly what had been said. The angel told them, you'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And there... They get to the manger and they find this baby boy that was the savior of the world. They had been waiting for this baby for years. Finally, he's here. And what the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2 is the shepherds actually bowed down and worshiped. And I think that's important because that's something that you and I have the opportunity to do as well. You and I are invited to do that as well. Tell you what, I, I think it'd be good. I, there's a carol that I grew up singing when I was a kid called The Way in the Manger. You guys just looking at this picture of the nativity, can we just sing that together? And I want you to think about how the Son of God actually came as a baby boy. Ready? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Didn't they do a great job? Good job. Thank you. Let's give our hand to our actors. Quiet hand for baby Jesus. As you picture this, real life people that we read about in the book of Luke. Everybody say Luke. May say chapter 2. I want you to imagine, the, the reason why it's important for us to imagine them as real life people is because when we see them as real life people, we'll recognize that the story is for real life people like you and for me, like, like you and like me. Mary and Joseph were just people like you and me. And here's the good news. The Son of God became a person for you and for me. Why is that so important? Do you remember what the angels, you guys heard the voiceover, but do you remember what the angel told the shepherds? The angel said this, do not be afraid. I bring you great good news. It will bring great joy for all the people. Did you know that all includes you? I told you before, I remember being a fourth or fifth grader and finding out that I wasn't invited to a party. But guess what? When it comes to the best party ever, when it comes to being a part of the family of God, everyone is invited. That's the story of Christmas. The first people that God chose to, choose, to tell about his son being born were a group of shepherds. They weren't, they weren't high on the social ladder. They, wasn't, they weren't the popular kids. But he told them, why? Because he wanted us to know that everybody, everybody gets to be invited. Everybody gets to be a part of God's family. The truth is, you and I are not born into God's family. Did you know that? Sometimes I'll hear people say, well, we're all God's children. Well, I know what they mean by that. What they mean is God created everyone. That is true. I believe that. But we're not born into God's family. See, we have a problem. And the problem is that you and I aren't perfect. If I went up to you and I said, hey, are you perfect? I don't think I would find a person in this room that would say, yes, I'm perfect. I'm perfect all the time. We all know we're not perfect. And the Bible has a word for that. The Bible calls it sin. And that sin separates us from a perfect God. And here is the good news of the gospel. In fact, it's one of the most famous verses of the Bible. And it sums up the entire Bible, John 3.16. John 3.16 was spoken by Jesus that little baby boy that was born in a manger, he grew up and he said this. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, this verse tells us about two things that God did so that we can do something and become a part of God's family. And the first thing God did was God loved us. And when I say God so loved the world, you can read that as, yes, God loves the entire world, but I want you to read it more personally than that. 
Remember, we had real flesh and blood people come up here because I want you to know the story of Christmas is for real flesh and blood people like you and like me. So for God so loved Jesse, for God so loved John, for God so loved Sarah, God so loved Steffi, God so loved you, that God gave Jesus. And the reason why we have a picture of a cross on this one is because God loved, yes, but then God gave. God gave us Jesus at Christmas time. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that he put on humanity, almost like I put on my shirt this morning. See, Jesus had always existed, but he put on, he became a human because only as a human could he live the perfect life I couldn't. And only as a human could he die on a cross. And the way God looked at it, when Jesus died on the cross, the blood that came out of his body paid for all of my sin, paid for all of your sin. I went to a restaurant this week, and as I did, there was a group of friends there, and I told my wife, I said, hey, let's buy their meal. And so they didn't know about it, but before, before we left, we said, we'd like to buy their meal. We paid for their meal, and then we left. And they texted us later and said, oh, thank you for that, because they figured it out. We were trying to keep it a surprise. But we did that. Now, here's the thing. When we paid for that meal, the, my friends, when the waitress came to them and said, hey, by the way, someone paid for your meal today, they could have said, no, I don't want that. I'd like to pay for my own meal. But they didn't do that. They said, oh, wow, what a gift. They were so happy to have that. And guys, here's the thing. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he paid for the wrong that you've done. And guess what? When he rose from the dead, he proved he could pay for it. He proved that he was the son of God. It was just like, it was just like us this week when we said, hey, I'd like to pay for their bill. That's what Jesus did for you. That's what Jesus did for me. When he died on the cross, he said, hey, I'd like to pay for the wrong that they've done. And here's the thing. I said God did two things, and we get to do something in response. You don't have to do this. And like I said, not everybody, not everybody does this. We're not born into God's family, but we are invited and if you'd like to be a part of God's family, all you have to do is believe that Jesus did it for you. Now, the picture on this might confuse you because it's a chair. And you might say, what does a chair have to do with believing? Well, when you came in and you sat down, I didn't see any of you. I was actually watching. I didn't see any of you stop and say, now, hold on. Will this chair hold me up? How strong is this chair? No, you know what I saw all of you do? You came in and you sat down. You trusted the chair to hold you up. See... That's what it looks like to put your trust in Jesus. I remember I was probably a little bit older than you when I finally got to a point where I said, you know what? I'm trusting that Jesus paid for my sin on the cross. I trust that. If I told you I believed in this chair, do I? What about now? What about now? What about now? See, there was a moment when I said, okay, God, I'm going to take you at your word. You tell me that when I ask for forgiveness for my sin, that you forgive me, you make me a new person. The Bible tells us that when I accept what Jesus did for me, I'm adopted into God's family. I believe and I receive. See, when I believe that Jesus did it for me, I receive eternal life. I get adopted into God's family. That's the greatest gift ever. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas time. We say Jesus is God's greatest gift because he truly is. Jesus is the way that you and I get to be a part of God's family. And guess what? Everybody is invited. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You might be listening to me tonight and you might say, Mr. Jesse, I don't know that I've ever asked Jesus to be my savior. And what I'd ask you to do is I'd really ask, would you, just, would you just think about talking to your small group leader or Mr. John or me or Miss Steffi or Miss Sarah because we would love to help you take this step for yourself. But here's the thing, even if, even if you don't feel like you can do that, all it is is talking to God. You could pray tonight. You could say, God, I believe that Jesus died for me on, on the cross and I accept his free gift and I would like to be forgiven of my sin and be adopted into God's family. And just by saying it, you can know that today you're a part of God's family. There's no hoops you have to jump through. You don't have to be something special. You just have to, just like I sat on the chair, you just have to put your trust in Jesus. But with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd like to pray for us that all of us would know that we are invited into God's family. Dear God, thank you for the story. Help us to remember the story of Christmas is for everyone, that all of us are invited into God's 
big story that we are all invited to be a part of your family. Lord, if there's any kid in this room that has not accepted your invitation to be in your family, I pray that they would not be able to go to sleep tonight before they put their trust in you, before they sit down and depend on you, just like they would trust in the chair, they trust in what Jesus did for them. And Lord, not only do I pray that they would do that before they go to sleep, I also pray that those kids would have the courage to tell someone that they did it, that they would tell their leader when they go to group, or that they would tell their parents before they go to bed. But I pray that in the name of Jesus. And all God's children said,